<clears throat> so as Ravi was saying, uh, the work that I'm going to be sharing with you today centers on, yep, just sort of like how I said that I think about making science education more just uh, for emerging bio multilingual students through centering their translanguaging practices. And um, I, I, I wanted to start with this uh, quote from Irish poet and activist Padre Potuma, who says, um, I'm all for learning second and third languages, but not in the way to make people unfluent in the circumstances to do with their own agency individually as well as collectively. And here he was referencing to the legacy of colonialism and imperialism of the of Great Britain on Ireland, the, the all of Ireland, not just Republic of Ireland. But it made me think a lot about, um, or it makes you think a lot about how is it that the ways we push discourse or language or even ways of knowing um, make our students and our teachers feel unfluent about their own relationship to the natural world and about how their own agency and able to like ask questions and um, and, and know more about the natural world that, that surrounds them. And uh, specifically within the context of science education, I think that there is a, a, a pretty big challenge that I am I'm, I'm working to disrupt. And I think that the first one is how is it that we have constructed science learning to be raised and classed um, in ways that tend to focus on remediation and these form normative ways of knowing and being um, that tell people that who they are is not okay or it's not welcomed into the science, not only lab, but in the classroom as well. Um, and how is it that these ways of knowing and being and communicating that the students bring to these learning environments, again, are seen as unrelated or even opposed to uh, what we're trying to do in the science classroom. And specifically uh, for by multilingual learners, um, this construct of academic language and appropriateness, what are quote unquote appropriate ways of, of communicating um, and how that organizes a lot of their educational experiences. And I think that this, for me, this overemphasis uh, has been placed on, or it's been an overemphasis placed on the acquisition of English-based vocabulary as if knowing the word both leads to conceptual understanding and more and moreover are, are markers of being welcomed or belonging in that space. And, and here, you know, they're represented on the top right by my arch nemesis, the, the word wall, which is pretty ubiquitous in all science classrooms, especially in the PK5 level. And I think, again, it's overtly used um, for multilingual learners. And um, I, I really like this um, meme um, because it, it it captures a lot of what it is that I'm trying to like get at here. Where like I understand that there is this disposition to help, and we have construed helping and supporting multilingual and bilingual learners as a way of giving them language. But we're not recognizing how this is still very much embedded in uh, forms of oppression and forms of of power, um, and how they play out specifically in the science classroom. So um, as, as Ravid said, my, my background is in astrophysics. I was a cosmologist for uh, a, a long while. And then when I was transitioning into science education, I became very interested in like, how is it that we are construing these kinds of science learning environments and teaching opportunities that um, reinforce um, oppressive dynamics and, and reinforce inequities. So for the past 12 years, I have been dedicated to thinking of like, what does it mean to liberate us and transform those conditions? Um, <clears throat> and it's work that I've done uh, when thinking about the features of the learning environment as a learning scientist, you know, I think a lot about design and what are the um, conditions or the structures that we can put into place to undo some of those systemic uh, forces and dynamics. Um, focusing a lot on professional teacher professional learning, uh, specifically through partnerships with districts and, and teachers, uh, where we recognize that we all bring something valuable to the table instead of me being like, you know, this is what you need to do. But really the bulk of my work has, uh, has focused on this sort of like PK-5 um, learning space, particularly in how is it that emerging and multilingual learners are making sense of the physical phenomena that we put in front of them. And this is some of the work that I brought, again, as Ravid was mentioning to the uh, NASM report, to the National Academies report that came out um, last year. Um, as a learning scientist, I always like to situate myself within kind of like the landscape of learning. And I recognize that it is multifaceted, that it's a, a, a complex system or set of processes that we can think of. Uh, but I'm mostly influenced by a sociocultural um, approach to learning and development. 
where we think of it as how is it that we're creating opportunities for um, students or learners to engage in these like processes that shift their participation in, in sociocultural meaning making activities. And then these processes then are reconstituted um, by the people, you know, and depending on what it is that they want to accomplish instead of just being absorbed kind of like wholesale. And, um, and, and an extension of this sort of like sociocultural approach is also thinking about the political dimension of, of teaching and learning and development. More specifically, how is it that we're thinking about the entanglement between education and these projects of oppression um, that we see in classrooms or in learning spaces more broadly? So how is it that we can disrupt that to be able to support students achieve self-determination? So for the science classroom specifically, you know, again, like my, if my goal is to engage students in this complex intellectual activity, then what is it that I need to do to be able to position students as knowledgeable agents rather than, you know, people who need fixing, who need remedial kind of instruction. And I think that the, um, the NRC framework lays out a pretty important path or, or context for us to think with, I've been, of course, supported by decades of research before. Um, but the acknowledgement that learning is a cultural process where people bring not only their everyday experiences and knowledges and ways of communicating, but also who they are and what they care about. And how is it that we should be leveraging their uh, conceptual understanding, their linguistic resources, their cultural values um, as part of the kind of teaching and learning that we promote in science classrooms, again, as students develop uh, conceptual understanding of phenomena, but as well, you know, through engaging in these kinds of like science practices. And when I think about justice within these kinds of spaces, the concept of heterogeneity for me is very important because I don't want a system that gives people ideas. Again, you know, I'm, I'm interested in creating opportunities for transformation and self-determination through exerting, um, exercising agency. So how is it that we can disrupt these models of banking pedagogy that I think have been pretty uh, common in, in STEM learning environments? but also not in a way that promotes sameness. You know, I, I, I want to make sure that we create a space where different people have different ways in and have different ways out, but also create a space where, you know, everybody can come together and collectively make sense of a problem from all of these different perspectives. So again, you know, the, the importance of leveraging this or framing learning and development as a heterogeneous process, where again, all of these different meaning-making practices are coming in contact with each other, not only the ones that people have developed in physics laboratories for centuries, uh, millennia, I would say, but also again, their own ways of knowing, being and valuing um, into the space. And it is in that contact, I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but again, in that interaction, that heterogeneous interaction, that's where I think the, um, the word and, and, and the world can move forward. Uh, personally, uh, the framework of productive disciplinary engagement uh, from Engel and Conan has been particularly productive, uh, if you will, <laughs> pun not intended, because I think that it opens up different kinds of knowing and being in the classroom that um, I think frame a lot of the work that students can be doing, but also um, leave open a lot of possibilities for how that work is gonna get done. So, so, so through promoting uh, spontaneous participation, um, through attending to the substantial contributions and assuming that students are gonna make substantial contributions to knowledge making, um, and also in ways that are group-based and communal through where students are attending to and building on each other's ideas. Um, so, you know, principles of problematizing content, like being able to ask questions, being able to like recognize that there is a there there to like ask questions about where students are in a position to author uh, their own explanations, their own knowledge or interpretations of the data where they are accountable in some kind of way to these local and maybe global sense-making communities. So like how is it that we have decided as a group to like understand something? Um, and again, and, and very importantly, thinking about the, the, the resources that we're making available for students to support them in that process, both either material, uh, which I know is a, um, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a stumbling block in a lot of under-resourced schools where we just don't provide the, the money to be able to afford all these kinds of things, but also the symbolic resources, like how is it that we are allowing different concepts, ideas, ways of communicating to be uh, helpful in this process of engaging disciplinarily. 
this is all great. And I think that this is kind of shared across um, a lot of kind of like science education projects. What I think is for me important is to connect that to the histories of linguistic injustice that are very much present in the US educational um, system. And I find that the construct of racial linguistics is very helpful in understanding how is it that um, these ideas about whose language is valuable and how is it that we are attaching language to racialization process is pretty helpful for, again, understanding these assimilationist um, stances that our education system has had. And again, that we are seeing in, or that I'm seeing in science ed education environments where the idea is moving students into a, 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 a homogenous way of communicating. So I, I, the, the, the analogy or the metaphor that I've been using recently is to think of it as a hydra because racial linguistic not only affects multilingual learners in science learning and spaces, but it's very much connected to other forms of oppression uh, that racialized by multilingual folks experience, not only in schools, but outside. Um, thinking a lot of um, the cultural genocide of native peoples um, in the Americas through, for example, the um, residential schools and how they prohibited the um, speaking of native languages as a way of, you know, um, stopping culture from moving forward. Um, but also the anti-blackness that we see um, in, in the enforcement of quote unquote standardized versions of English that again are very pervasive in schools um, and society um, at large. And you know, it's it's no coincidence then that from this perspective we see that bimultilingualism is only valued uh, for white speakers. You know, if you're a white person who's speaking or learning French or or learning Mandarin, that's celebrated. But if you are um, a person from Haiti, for example, who speaks multiple languages like Spanish and Haitian Creole and English, then that is devalued. Um, also, the restrictive language policies that we see across in educational institutions, like in my own state of Massachusetts, there was a provision that prohibited the teaching. Of, uh, of languages other than English or even like bilingual education. And that has been an ongoing fight for decades to try and roll that back. Voter supported, I should say, policy, uh, not here, just but in California, Arizona as well. Even the way that we describe these students as English language learners really tells or sends a very strong signal of how is it that learning English is the main defining characteristic or priority for the educational experiences of these students. And again, as an astrophysicist who is multilingual, who grew up elsewhere and saying to myself, like, why on earth are we prioritizing this thing when there are many other aspects of human experience and human life that we should be uh, promoting um, in the, especially in the elementary uh, classroom. So, you know, how is it that even in our own constructions of, of, of identities and assumptions and labels, we are uh, closing opportunities for students. And instead we should be um, celebrating or uh, uh, adhering to ideologies that really celebrate the students' multilingualism, multiculturalism, and again, seeing them as able and willing and interested in learning science. But these languages, like language ideologies that we see in science classrooms, I think that are inherited in some kind of way from what we see in science um, at large. The, the, the fact of the matter is that, as I said earlier, like people have been in relationship with the natural world in their own ways of communicating for thousands and thousands of years, right? So, and it wasn't until English became the, the lingua franca of the world through these processes of expansion and colonialism and empire that we see the sciences um, and STEM more broadly adopting it as the, its own language. Um, so, you know, people who make contributions to our understanding of a natural and design world in Quechua or Farsi or Tagalog or Arabic, you know, they are completely ignored because as a society, as an instead of institutional um, disciplines, we have decided that those are grounds for exclusion. Um, to the detriment of science, to the detriment of our own understanding and relationship to the natural world, because more and more, I would say maybe for the past like five to 10 years, we're recognizing the harm that having a homogeneous um, way of communicating in the, in kind of like in our, in our field is, is doing and where, how is it that we can start um, rolling back some of that, um, some of those damages. 
and I think quite frankly, it's really um, ironic because like I understand that language serves a role and ways of communicating um, are negotiated and promoted within professional and, and learning communities or disciplinary communities or communities of practice. But the reality is that the universe doesn't come with a glossary, right? Like they're, they're, you don't look at a star and it has a label that it says, call me star. Um, instead, these special, uh, specialized discourses are created by people as, you know, as they need it. And yes, you know, we always start with questions. We always start with observations that we are trying to like make sense of. And from there, we can say that, okay, well, here is a conceptual shorthand in the form of a conceptual or a technical vocabulary word that we can use as we communicate with each other with like insiders. Um, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of these quote unquote scientific terms are nothing more than everyday words in Latin or Greek, which already says a very, um, or you know, sends a very strong message about whose cultures, whose ancient cultures were valuing, right? So like this whole idea of the science siesta, there was no science for 2000 years between the year uh, 500 um, BCE and the 1500 CE, you know, we're, and, and we're saying that in the heels of uh, waves and waves and waves of, um, of the Crusades and trying to like expel uh, people of Muslim descent from Europe, then we're saying, oh no, no, we have to go back to the Greek and Romans because they had it right. So again, like there's a lot of politics and sort of like political decisions involved in even the way that we communicate in science. And again, from a racial linguistics perspective, it's like, you know, like what is seen as appropriate, you know, like who gets to say um, that that is the right way of calling this? Who gets to say that this is the right way of, of communicating about this idea? For me, you know, against this background, then the construct of translanguaging is very helpful because it helps me understand how all of these boxes and labels that we have constructed around ways of communicating are exactly that. They are socially and politically constructed. So the, the term or the construct of translanguaging tries to undo a lot of those barriers that have been created by people, by society, and that not only serve social purposes, but also serve political purposes to think more broadly of the linguistic repertoire that people have developed that includes these things that we call named languages like Spanish and English, and also in, um, includes these things that we call registers like quote unquote everyday um, and scientific. So instead of moving between these boxes and, and having, for example, you know, two brains or kind of like two languages in one brain, it's instead a broader collection of linguistic resources that people are able to marshal depending on the context that they're in and what is the meaning of meaning, meaning making activity that they're trying to accomplish. So the way that you and I are talking right now is different from the way that I would talk to uh, someone in federal office. And it's very different from the way that I would talk to my parents. And that all comes from the same repertoire instead of having those different kind of like compartment or boxes, quote unquote, within myself. But um, so in, in, from this perspective, then a translanguaging space or learning space is one where we're not policing these resources and how people use them for meaning making purposes. And instead we create a, uh, an environment where um, it's, everything is more broadly accepted and invited and seen as appropriate. But the construct I think that has been um, over specified around um, kind of like logocentric, sort of like the written and spoken word. Um, it comes out of bilingual education and literacy education, um, which I think is fine, but it's not the only way that we communicate. And, you know, people like Chuck Goodwin within the learning sciences have been doing, had done a lot of good work within this space of recognizing all of these like semiotic resources and semiotic repertoires that people have. So for me, then translanguaging should go beyond the written and spoken word and think more of these like, um, again, kind of like paralinguistic ways of communicating like gestures and gaze and drawings and so on and so on and so forth. Again, as, as a way of breaking down these asymmetries between written and spoken, which again are very Eurocentric forms of communication um, to be a lot more inclusive in this way. And yeah, this is Niels Bohr and his Aten in 1940, his gesturing. <laughs> He's gesturing kind of like what the model of the atom looks like and where the electrons are positioned in relation to the nucleus, which to me, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cute photo, but then it also sends a very, you know, it's very clear then 
that physicists have been doing this or scientists have been doing this for a while, you know, in terms of like how they communicate. It's just that for political reasons, we've decided that some people can do it and some people cannot. Um, but if they all serve the purpose of understanding the natural world, then why are we making that distinction other than for political reasons again? So the, the, the questions then that got, have been guiding my work for this whole time is like, well, you know, first of all, like how is it that these emerging bilingual students are problematizing physical phenomena? Like what questions are they asking? What explanations are they coming with? Like what counts as a, as a good prediction? And then simultaneously, um, you know, what are the semiotic resources that they're bringing to bear when they're engaging in this process of problematizing the phenomena? And, um, and then of course, I'm, I'm very interested in what does this mean for teacher education and how do we support people both in service and pre-service to develop that um, um, interpretive lens that Roseberry Warren and, and Tucker, Raymond Tucker call, um, talk about. And all of these are separated for analytical purposes, but I see them all kind of like, again, enmeshed with each other. So um, this, I'm gonna show you some examples of, of how I see this happening kind of like live in different kinds of learning spaces. And I'm gonna be sharing with you um, data from two projects, one that happened within um, schools um, where it was a partnership with K K3 teachers. And then another uh, set of the data comes from this out of school time learning environment that I developed in partnership with a local library um, where I lived in a Rocky Mountain state. Um, for those of you who are kind of like, again, learning sciences and, and interested in design, I wanted to share with you what my conjecture map looked like, at least um, this portion of the conjecture map that relates to uh, the high level conjecture of what it means to invite and leverage the multiple semiotic resources that students bring to the learning environment. This one specifically from the um, out of school time environment. Um, so, you know, like I, I had to build specific participation structures around like, what do I do as a facilitator to uh, look those out, look, look out for those and invite them in. And what are the discursive practices that I'm gonna be sanctioning or valuing uh, or making space for, it's difficult to design for something that you don't know what's going to be there. So you kind of like almost have to kind of like put a donut around it and leave that space for it to be populated by what students bring in. Um, and then just looking through like the mediating process. So like, well, you know, like if these participation structures and discursive practices are in place, then I should be seeing how students are using multiple semiotic resources for explaining electric flow in a circuit. Um, and then ultimately, you know, like, what does it say about um, the learning that's happening in that space? So, you know, just I don't I don't get to share this often because a lot of people don't know conjecture maps. So I, 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 I like to geek out a little bit on this. Um, for these two projects, I engaged in what some people call a semiotic or a linguistic ethnography, where I use multiple sources of data or multiple data collection methods to collect different kinds of, of data to be able to have um, a broad complex picture of the semiotic work that is happening in the space while students are engaging in this kind of a problematizing. So from different cameras to the documents that they um, created, uh, ethnographic journal entries, like my own recordings of conversation with partners about design, and then um, I, for this, I attended or kind of like I said, no, I said, I, I focus, I focus a lot on, again, these sort of like translanguaging practices that have to do with the lamination, as, as Chuck Goodwin would call it, the lamination of all of these semiotic resources that are coming into play while um, they are attending to these sort of like artifacts and other things that they have in front of them when they are investigating um, these phenomena. And uh, uh, they will become a little bit more apparent here in a bit when I show you more of the data. So just to kind of like give you a sense of what the, the, the preliminary analysis looks like with all of these layers, um, you know, kind of like come into um, to play is, here's an excerpt that looks at the spoken, you know, sort of like the utterance, sort of like, you know, the linguistic resources, the spoken, the logocentric form of communication in this case, it's Spanish and English. And I try to be um, clear about what I'm translating from and into, if you will. Then I'm also including a lot of the images that have to do with the thing that the students were working on. Um, and then from there, I try to identify, you know, like what are the practices of problematizing that are being involved here? Are they 
kind of like coming up with a model? Are they asking a question? Are they collecting data? And then at the same time, I'm keeping track of these translanguaging practices that have to do with this sort of like fluid use of different semiotic resources and the semiotic lamination that is happening there. So it's kind of complex, but it gives me a, a, a better sense of kind of like, again, how all of these things are connected to each other. So, um, and then when it comes to science, I, uh, the science practices, I'm really interested in mechanistic reasoning and mechanistic type of explanations. Um, and I draw mainly here from the work that Rosemary Russ has done. And then most recently, um, Sina Chris with Brian Reiser and Christina Schwartz uh, published a paper from a few years ago on uh, mechanistic reasoning, um, essentially epistemic heuristics, really wonderful, you should go read it. Uh, but I'm not looking just for causal explanations, like X causes Y, but I'm really interested in how is it that the students are attending to the conditions for a phenomenon to happen? What are the elements or the entities involved in that process? And then, um, and again, just sort of like the activities or the processes through which, you know, we're not just connecting A to B, but all of these intermediary steps that, you know, like make that happen. And then <clears throat> I'm also really interested in dimensions of gesture. So I'm looking at the different kinds of gesturing to represent or to perform different functions in communicating. So the ictic gestures that have to do with pointing or touching as a way of bringing attention to something. Um, and then these sort of like more iconic and metaphoric gestures that are meant to represent processes and tangible abstracts ideas. Um, again, sort of like I'm thinking of mechanistic explanation. If I'm moving my hand around in a circle, then it shows kind of like a process um, that I'm very excited about. So that's kind of like my analysis. So let, let's look at some data here. The first one I'm gonna share with you is from this student, uh, Yesenia, who um, was trying to figure out why is it that when she was uh, connecting a light bulb to a circuit that had a thick conductor, um, it shone brighter than when she connected the same light bulb to a, th a circuit with thinner conductors. And here the physics is that, you know, the, the bigger the conductor, the geometry of the conductor affects how much electricity can flow. Uh, through the space and therefore it makes it brighter or dimmer. So for Yesenia, um, <clears throat> she noticed this difference and I asked her, you know, like, a ver, you know, show me, que está pasando, like what's happening? And then the translation is at the bottom here in italics if it's helpful. And then she says, la energía puede ir más rápido en este lado, she points to the white conductor, porque está muy chiquito y hay menos espacio para que la electricidad vaya. Y aquí hay más espacio. Entonces será más fácil que vaya acá, pero a veces se atora aquí y no puede volver a la batería. I say, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, and what about this one, this thin one? It will go slower, she says, and it might, it might take a longer time to get through. Or it could, it would be harder for the energy to go through. So this to me is a, a pretty complex explanation as to how the, the thickness of the conductor affects the electrical resistance of the circuit. So we're moving away from thinking about electrical resistance in binary way, conductor resistor, to thinking more of that spectrum of like what would make something a good conductor or a bad conductor. And this is exactly what she's doing here, right? Like she is not only um, understanding that there is a cause and effect, a change in the thickness changes uh, the brightness of a bulb, but she's attending to <clears throat> how the space affects the, um, the, the, you know, kind of like the space available or the thickness of, uh, affects the space available for the electricity to move through, how it affects um, the amount of effort it would take to push the electricity through, how much um, time it would take for the electricity to move through, um, and all of these are not quite canonical explanations because um, electrical resistance is actually a very complex problem um, at, a, at a nanoscopic level. But all of these are, again, very sophisticated ways of understanding this. And I should have said, she's a rising fourth grader. So she was wrapping up third grade by this point. Uh, so all of these are very complex explanations as to like why, again, changing the thing, changing the thickness affects the brightness. And uh, from a very mechanistic kind of like perspective. 
What's an and um, another layer of this interaction that is really interesting to me is her um, choice of verbiage. Well, not just verbiage, but uses of verbs uh, when describing the or reciting her explanations, either using um, resources from Spanish or resources from English. So in Spanish, she uses the verb estar, which is a temporary version of the verb to be in Spanish. We have two versions, estar, a temporary ser, which is permanent. Um, <clears throat> and then in English, she uses the would be, which is sort of like similar to the to be, which again is both temporary and permanent. In English, we don't have that easy way of distinguishing between the temporary and the permanent version of the to be verb, unless we add a lot of extra contextual features. But in Spanish, it's very easy. You can say either estar, temporary, ser, permanent. So her choice of using the verb estar, or the, ver the temporary version of the verb here, signals to me that she's thinking of the thickness as a variable that she herself can change, that this is not a uh, immutable state of the circuit, but instead um, this is something again that, you know, like she has uh, possibility and control over, which again, it makes me think that it's not just, it's not only that she's thinking of this processes from a mechanist mechanistic perspective, but she recognizes what are the conditions of this situation that she has control over and she could change. And effectively, you know, if you change the thickness, you change the brightness, uh, which again, for me is, is sophisticated. And if we would have required her only to speak in English, then we would have missed that distinction unless we would have probed for it. Uh, but again, like being able to have, be in a, in a learning space where she can use those um, more fluidly then we have access to this like layer of understanding that wasn't quite there or we couldn't have access to. Um, within the same program, um, we had this other set of students who were trying to um, explain how we said that an electricity, uh, that electricity flows through a circuit. And here on the left, you see the speech uh, from that interaction. And then um, Grace says, if you connect them, it bounces off here. And it goes, and it goes all the way over here, and they're the same. So I, I don't know you, but I had a really hard time understanding what exactly she meant. How is it that electricity was flowing through that circuit if I didn't look at what she was doing while she was saying that? So I went to the video, and then let me show you kind of like what she's doing while she's saying that. Oh. I realized that I don't know if I shared my sound, but I think we could just see it, um, you know, just just kind of like fine and see like how she was moving her um, hands in this way. So again, when we pair her speech with her gesturing, specifically not just her gesturing, but her gesturing over the circuit, we see that <clears throat> she had um, she was using these kind of like deictic types of gestures to point and to bring attention to. Um, the, the different wires and how was, they were moving electricity and then how they met at this at the at light bulb and then they would come back. And um, ultimately what she was proposing is what some people have reported or called the clashing current model of electricity. Again, canonically, we know that that is not correct. The you know, electricity flows in the circuit. Regardless, it is a, it's a sophisticated explanation for a rising second grader finishing first grade. Um, and because we were able to see how she was, again, gesturing that lamination of speech and gesture and the object and the artifact, um, we can understand the sophisticated mechanistic explanation that she had for how, how is it that when you collect a light bulb to a battery, the light bulb um, lights up. Um, I'm gonna show you one more example. Um, and this one in particular comes from a third grade unit that was about uh, sound production and sound waves. And here I, I was, you know, kind of a co-planning activities and also being a researcher with a teacher and the teacher, you know, to her credit, uh, she had said some 
expectations around how students were going to be participating in all of her um, classes, um, all of her content areas. And she wanted students to share spontaneously. Uh, she wanted students to listen to each other. And then she also wanted students to get into the habit of justify their thinking. And I should say that for her, these three were important because this was a sheltered English immersion program where all of the students were classified as uh, ELLs or English language learners by the district. And she thought that these expectations for classroom activities would be productive for supporting not only their conceptual understanding and learning, but also the, their language development. So in this particular case, uh, our session students were trying to like make sense of a guitar or a guitar like it was a string instrument that is very much like the one here on the left, which is sort of like a, a, a pegboard with some um, fishing line and then some hooks that you could uh, adjust the tightness or the tension on the string. So the very first, you know, within the very first minute that we introduced the guitar, one of the students said, Gustavo, he was like, oh, I know what it sounds like. And it sounds tick, tick, tock, 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 tong, tong. And I was like, oh, wait, which one makes ting, ting? And then the first one makes ting, ting. And then the second one makes tang, tang. And the third one makes tong tong. And I'm not showing you the video here, but he, when Gustavo said it, he said tick tick, tuck tuck, tock tock, tong tong. So he himself was kind of like moving up and down, and he was moving up and down his hands at the same time that he was repeating or emulating the sound using the sort of like the pitch of the sound that would make um, again to like signal both the 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 sound that he was hearing and what the string was doing. <clears throat> what was really interesting is that even though he was the one who generated these um, onomatopoeic labels, all of the other students who participated in this 15 minute discussion also used the labels themselves, which very much like in the sciences, you know, Gustavo proposed a term, a way of describing something, a way of labeling something, and the other students in the community in a way that they were accountable to each other found it useful and when they were sharing their own explanations. So then these ting tang tong, these like onomatopoeias became, um, again, kind of like the, the, the terms per excellence that the students were using for describing their thinking. And they knew pitch, the teacher had introduced pitch, to, you know, like twice before, but they decided that ting tong tong was way more efficient at communicating their ideas than saying low pitch and high pitch. In fact, there had been some arguments about what counts as high pitch because some students thought that something would be high pitch and some others thought it wasn't as high as they thought they were. So this ting tang tong almost in a way uh, erased that ambiguity and everybody understood what it meant. So they used it every time they had to, they wanted to explain why is it that the, the sound sounds the way that it does and why is it that the strings physical features uh, produce that kind of sound. Again, they refer to these um, onomatopoeias. And an example of this um, came from Bruno who realized that the tension on the string made a difference. Uh, so he says here, you know, I think that um, <clears throat> the I think that the first string is ting ting uh, because this part, and he points to the eye hook, uh, is really tight. And this part, and then he plugs the string, look, you know, this part is medium and this part is really tight. And then, you know, kind of like 30 seconds go by. And then he says, the tong tong is kind of tight. It makes, it's making a tung tung because this part is kind of loose. This part is more looser than this one. And this part is more looser than this one. That's why it's making a lower sound over here. And this one is super, super loose. So the first thing I'll point out here is the interesting um, usage or kind of like mixing of both the ting, the tang, the tong and lower. So again, he understands lower sound. It's just that he would find most helpful to say ting, tang, tong when he is talking at other times. And I don't, I don't know why he finds it that way, but that's the, kind of like the, what we're seeing here. Um, but also from a physics perspective or, you know, or in conjunction with from a physics perspective, he basically constructs two different spectra to refer to the same phenomenon, which is, or to refer to the same construct, which is tightness or tension. So he constructs one spectra that goes from tight to really, really tight and how that really, you know, in that direction, it's increasing the pitch. So it goes from tong to ting. But in the other way around, he goes from loose to super loose. So he's attending to looseness and how a loose goes ting to a super loose that goes tong. So again, you know, in, in these kind of like combination of onomatopoeia as experience-based labels, He's constructing a, 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 sophisticated, a sophisticated explanation for why is it that the 
physical features of the string, in this particular case, the tension, is responsible for creating different kinds of sounds from the instrument. But what I found even more interesting is that in this specific case of tension, every student had their own way of saying tension. Some students said hard, some said strong, some said tight. Uh, and those are the color dots. But they, when, um, when they were making those explanations or where they were offering those explanations, they again were connecting it to the ting, the tang, the tong. So tong is loose and tight and ting is strong, for example. Um, and while they all agreed on the ting, tang, tong being the labels that they, everyone would use, they didn't quite agree on the, how they would describe tension, but that didn't stop them from understanding each other and engaging with each other's ideas. So there is a moment of semiotic heterogeneity that is happening here around the description of tension that I would argue is not impeding this conceptual convergence in understanding how is it that the tension as a, as a physical feature of the string is responsible for producing sounds of, with different pitch. So again, the, the, the fact that we say things differently, heterogeneity in this moment is not detrimental um, at all to like conceptual understanding. I'm, I'm not gonna say that it helps it, but it's certainly not an obstacle at this stage. And again, we see, I didn't show you all of the examples, but again, you know, like heterogeneity, I would argue supports meaning making in all of these um, examples. They help us understand how is it that the geometry of a conductor affects electrical resistance. They help us understand how is it that uh, wires carry electricity or current. They help us understand how is it that string instruments produce different kinds of uh, sounds all through engaging in these like scientific, quote unquote, scientific practices and translanguaging practices simultaneously where we are achieving meaning making goals, understanding, problematizing, questioning, explaining through laminating all of these forms of communication um, in learning environments that not only allow them but encourage students to do that instead of um, short circuit them, if you will. Um, so, I think that, you know, like the, the, you know, it's kind of like trying to like bring it together because I know that we're running low on time. For me, um, the first thing that I, I would like people to take away from this is like recognize that it is on us as researchers and educators to learn to see and value the sense-making repertoires that students bring to a learning environment. Instead of seeing them as deficient or naive or bringing quote unquote misconceptions, like we should be understanding how is it that um, all of these ways of communicating and being and meaning making practices that students bring to a learning environment are useful and not only useful, but they are sophisticated in their own right. They're sophisticated in and of themselves. And, and they're not stepping stones. Like these are not initial ideas that we need to leave behind. These are not initial ways of communicating that we need to leave behind. But instead, we should be creating and learning environments where all of these are being um, are available and are valued because they serve different purposes at different times. And the moment we start um, closing the door on some of these practices, the more likely we are to continue uh, to perpetuate these power dynamics that lead to inequitable educational experiences and injustices. And <clears throat> I think that there is a lot of value in thinking about our learning environment as a potential like translanguaging space, not only where different name languages come together, but as a lot of people in the learning sciences have shown, where different forms of communication, different semiotic uh, resources come into uh, coordination. And again, dismantling these power boundaries and power structures that say this kind of discourse is acceptable, this kind of discourse is appropriate, this kind of discourse is not appropriate. And moving away from this like benevolent helper stance where we're giving people forms of communication that are again are quote unquote acceptable. And then finally, you know, like what are we doing from an analytical perspective that can help us see more of these um, sophisticated ways of understanding, sophisticated ways of constructing knowledge, sophisticated ways of communicating. Um, and how are we bringing uh, work from other areas, maybe outside of education or outside of like, um, you know, kind of like the social sciences to be able to, you know, kind of like put together a more complex set of lenses or analytical lenses through which we can understand again, this like very complex activity. 
with that, um, thank you again so much for the invitation. Um, I hope that we have a little bit more time for questions and answers. Um, but yeah, this is this is a, a, a dream come true. So I, I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Uh, well, well, what I suggest is we'll take an extra uh, 10 minutes, go over a bit uh, with Q&A if uh, people absolutely have to go up, we understand, but otherwise, if you can hang on with us for another little bit of time, that would be great. So um, if you have questions online, please either raise your hands or write them in the chat. Uh, do we have questions uh, in the room? Anybody here have Drew? Go ahead and speak up because we've been having trouble having people here. Hi, Enrique. Thank you so much. This was phenomenal. Um, so this is um, uh, sort of a more practical question or implementation question. What are the implications for the language resources of teachers in this context? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a really good question. I think especially a point in one in the in the context of our educational system that is primarily um, made up of monolingual um, English speakers. Um, so I think that there are uh, there are, there are two things, you know, one in the short term and then one in the long term. I think in the short term, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a you know, or or there is an obstacle in being a, a you know kind of like having a lot of monolingual speakers in the classroom. Um, I, I I work in that in that third grade classroom that I um, showed. You know, we had students from eleven different countries who spoke nine different languages, and I could um, speak to understand a third and maybe a fourth. Um, but the reality is that, especially in our you know very multicultural, multilingual cities, uh, not everybody's going to speak every uh, language, which is um, just just a fact of you know just a fact of life. Um, so with that, I think that we can bring uh, a, almost like a generous stance to the learning environment and recognize that there are moments when we ourselves may not be able to engage in that form of communication or, or use that name language. But that doesn't mean that we may not be able to create opportunities for those students to use their languages to do, you know, kind of like, again, engage in, in our activities. And that may um, include some simultaneous translation. I know that there are very sophisticated apps that are uh, out there now where allow people to like translate back and forth into different languages. Um, I think that there's a lot of value in um, just creating this space or, 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 or making the space a multilingual space, even if there's only one student who, speak, who speaks that language. Uh, there is a colleague at Wisconsin, her name is Emily Machado, who works in literacy education. And, um, and she did, a, one of her studies was looking at like how this elementary school teacher uh, invited every student to read a story that was important to them in their own language, you know, in Tagalog, in Arabic, in Farsi, in, um, in Spanish, in Portuguese. And even if they were the only ones who understood what they were saying, um, that made it to where the learning environment was expressly, was explicitly a multilingual learning space. Um, so, um, you know, for, for, for better or worse, English is the, the language that is going to bring us together here in this country. Um, and I don't think that we should shy away from it. Uh, but again, I, I do think that, you know, just sort of like taking steps to making sure that it's not the only way or it's not perceived to be as the language of science, because that now we're getting into trouble. Like even in bilingual programs, <clears throat> some people, um, you know, kind of like discipline students in Spanish, but the content in math and science, for example, is done in English. So that in and of itself sends a very strong message about what the function of language is and why do we use different languages. And it already creates a power hierarchy, an epistemological power hierarchy between those two. So that's in the short term. In the long term, I think that there's something to be said about not being afraid of multilingualism in this country. You know, I think that for political reasons, we've decided that English is the official language of the country and that people who speak other languages um, are seen as invaders or as elitist. Um, so, you know, I think that we should just work hard to like make sure that, you know, we become a plurilingual country in, 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 in both in policy and in expectation. I think that will go a long way too. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, very, very helpful. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Suarez. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, you, I just want to, I love what you just said about um, language, the way we use language. I even think of the people in a building, how like certain teachers, uh, you know, the what their race, ethnicity, whatever, um, who teach science and math, and then the teachers who teach PE or like the office workers or things like that. I think of it the same way. Um, as you said, with language. But I was wondering with Yasima, I think that was her name, um, was there a pedagogical reason to start the conversation with her in Spanish and then um, switch it to English because she was so sophisticated in Spanish? I was just wondering if the teacher did that on purpose. Um, so in this case, I'm very lucky because I have deep insight into the teacher. I, I was the teacher <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that I, I wish I could tell you that there was a good, a good reason for why I did that. And I, I don't, um, I think that, um, I myself grew up being bilingual, but having a very strict separation between the two languages, like you either speak Spanish or you speak English and quote unquote Spanglish is seen as inappropriate. So um, for the past like five to 10 years, I have been working actively to undo that, you know, kind of like that kind of separation even within myself. Um, and a lot of it was just how we felt comfortable in that moment. Um, I didn't show this graph. If you will, if I, I will just flash it and, um, oh my goodness. Let me see if I can get to this. Okay, so uh, this is in my 2020 uh, paper, if you wanna read a little bit more in depth about it. But um, what's interesting is that they were, they were following, so when, they, when it was just Yesenia and Elio working together, and again, we're kind of like English, Spanish, bilingual, like myself, um, sometimes we would be quote unquote, switching between name languages uh, or using resources from one name language instead of the other. But what I noticed was that they were following my lead. So if I started using resources in English, they would start using resources in English and vice versa in Spanish. But what was even more fascinating was that I could be, you know, when the students were working individually across the table from each other, I could be talking to Yesenia. And then if I start, I, I move from one system to the other, not only she would follow, but her brother Elio, who was sitting, you know, two or three feet away from me would hear me move away from that system and also follow it as well. And then he goes from voy a probar to himself to I almost did it. And this happened a few times throughout the program. So I don't have a good reason for why I did it in that moment. I knew that I wanted to be fluid and I wanted to send a very, you know, kind of a clear message that all of these languages are name languages are acceptable here in this space. But what became evident to me in retrospect, you know, when I was analyzing these data was that, oh, no, I even if I didn't mean to, I set the tone for what they thought was acceptable to use in that moment or appropriate to use in that moment, which was kind of scary because it, 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 it made me realize like how much power I had for shaping the learning environment. Um, without without intention. So it made me now it's making me think a lot of like, well, how do you you know, and um, how do you implement this language ideology? So what is your implicit language policy in your classroom that makes it to where, again, it's more or less acceptable to use name, one name language over, over another, if that makes sense? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jehan? Yes, I'm here. So thank you, Dr. This is very uh, interesting. I guess my question is about assessment. So I'm an, an educator, I teach Arabic, and then during class we use different dialects and different uh, varieties of uh, the language. And while it works during class time, but to prepare them for midterms and uh, final exams and to just assess their uh, proficiency level, uh, how do you see this going with the experiment of semiotic uh, resources and uh, what you do at, during class time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you for that question, uh, Jahan. So, um, one, I think that our assessment portfolio should be multimodal and just include as many semiotic resources um, or invite as many se semiotic resources as possible in general. Um, I, I think that 
um, and maybe it is because of my, my, my heritage or kind of like, you know, coming from Spanish or whatnot, um, even my own um, training in, in astrophysics, I think that spoken and written language are very limited. You know, we can only say so much through writing and talking. So um, there are very complex processes that are just difficult to capture in prose. So my invitation to assessment designers is always, how are we going to make our um, learning, our assessments be more multimodal, again, from the, from the get? Because we are leaving a lot of conceptual understanding on the table by only focusing on written word. Um, I understand the logistics of what that may entail. Like, you know, the teachers are overworked and underpaid. So, you know, they, that's, that's a policy question that we need to figure out still. Um, <clears throat> But I see no good reason for, again, to continue to hold on to these sort of like prose based uh, forms of assessment. Um, in terms, of, in terms of, of, of standards and kind of like recognizing the ways that people are being judged, I think that's a, that's a fair game conversation to have, right? I mean, I think that it is not, um, I think it's, it's, it's both respectful and I think it's political, politically sincere and kind of like moves us towards an idea or an, in, um, an embodiment of justice where we can say, hey, you know, like this is the way that society is going to measure you. You know, this is this is the measuring stick that they're going to bring to you and your capabilities and your identity and your way of being in the world. Um, therefore, you know, we I need to make sure that when you go up to take the Regents exam or the or the MCAS or the SAT, you're able to perform at that level because that's the expectation. Um, but, you know, as, as people like Gloria Latson Billings always reminds us, is understanding the standard doesn't mean that you have to assimilate into the standard or kind of like performing at, at the expectation level without questioning it as just assimilation. So I think that it is important to have that conversation around ideology um, and how these sort of like ideological, even the concept of proficiency, who gets to decide who's proficient? I mean, there's somebody who decides, but it's it's completely arbitrary. So, you know, let's let's be honest about it and say, well, you know, this is the way that, you know, we are measuring your proficiency. Um, you know, for example, in Spanish, right? Like almost every country in South America and Latin America speaks a different version of Spanish. Well, who gets to decide who is proficient? If I'm, if, I, if my Spanish is, is measured by somebody from Argentina, they may say that I don't speak a good Spanish. Um, so I'd rather be honest about it and recognize that that's what's going on than assume that there is a standard that is universal in that way. Um, so, but yeah, that that's kind of like how I think about it. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Are there uh, any other questions? And uh, uh, virtually, I'm not seeing any new hands. Um, um, so thank you so, so, so much, Dr. Suarez. This has been, uh, for funds, been really important. It's something that uh, I've been thinking about a lot as well. Um, science is particularly persnickety about language and languaging and in K-12 and throughout, uh, as well as academia in general. So this has been really helpful. Um, next week, we have Angela Booker coming. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, good company, right? Uh, well, can I come? <laughs> you can come, totally, same link. So um, please do come next week. Please come in person if you can. We have pizza, it's very good. We always have leftovers. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Suarez, one last uh, huzzah, and uh, we will see you all next week. Yeah, thank you all, and thank you for staying a little bit longer and being patient and flexible. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Come up.